really interested in how man experiences the nature of the physical world around him and how the tools of science come into that, how they help form that understanding or experience of the world. Every artist dreams about ridiculous, ambitious projects that they'd like to do, and we have a very long list of those things. It's interesting because art and science used to be the same thing. Back in the day of Leonardo, you know, he worked as a scientist and an artist, and for him there was no difference. There are as many relationships in common between art and science as there are differences. Artists and scientists have to be equally creative and they have to have concepts that connect with initial ideas and they go through an experimental process and then they have to find ways and of, of building or creating these, these ideas and visions. We come from quite a hands-on background so when we were at college we were working quite a sculptural way and making quite large-scale installation works. And then when we left college, we didn't have the space to do that and we started working with the computer. So we just started experimenting, really. There was no beginning, like, oh, we're working together now. It was more like three or four years had gone by and we'd made these works which didn't really have a specific home. They didn't fit necessarily into the art world or into the film world. They were somewhere in between. Last year we made a piece of work called Heliocentric where we followed the movement of the sun from before dawn till after dusk across the whole sky and it was quite a challenging piece of work um, because we had to know exactly where the sun was going to be and we used astronomical tracking equipment to track the motion of the sun. We got through several cameras because the, the shutter mechanism failed after, you know, 100,000 images. In many ways, it's a kind of taboo photographing and looking at the sun. You're not meant to do it. Um, you're not meant to point your camera straight into the sun. It actually looks like it's moving across the sky, even though it's always in the centre of the image. It creates a kind of optical illusion because you're so used to seeing it move across the sky and, and it actually becomes a bit like a spaceship, even though it's staying still in the middle of the image. And in some ways, it is a spaceship. Our inspiration can come from many different sources, quite often directly from experience. So we often do residencies or artist fellowships that put us in specific locations and then we'll make work that responds to that. We spent six months in a NASA space sciences lab and quite intensely worked with the scientists there, observing them being in the lab nine to five every day. And the whole time we were there, the scientists that we were engaging with were mainly working around magnetic fields. So we were intrigued as to what magnetic fields are, you know, this idea of this material that you can't see, you can't touch it, but they kept on talking about it and they tried to depict it in a way that isn't really truthful to the actual material. Magnetic fields are by their nature invisible. There are some things that nature does to make them more visible. Uh, for example, in the corona, the magnetic fields control the atmosphere to the extent that you can see loops. We started thinking about interplanetary magnetic fields existing in their laboratory, as though that there were experiments they were doing um, in situ. Magnetic movie had quite an interesting life beyond our control. Um, it got posted on YouTube and it started to create quite a debate where people were arguing as to whether it was real or not, or you know, some people said that they thought it should come up with a warning at the beginning saying this is art, not science. We'd seen one photograph of the sun and one of the scientists' cubicles. These were very raw black and white images that had quite a lot of noise in them and we were really intrigued by them. So we started to investigate these further and we discovered there were these whole archives that we could access of these images. And we ended up 
pulling about how many files did we end up downloading? About a million. About a million files mm. over about a period of three months. Throughout the whole history of our work, we've had a relationship between the sound and image, which is more than just choreographing. We're always using the sound to generate or control the image or vice versa. That interest in the relationship between sound and image really stems from when we were first exploring the computer and trying to understand the digital nature of it. And so that's something we've continued throughout our work. And it also extends into our interest into the landscape, the idea of the world around us being in this constant state of flux and never in a kind of a fixed state. So we're interested that everything has the potential to be moving the whole time and normally this exists as kind of waveforms throughout the world around us. In the current work that we're making, we spent a lot of time on the side of volcanoes and in lava landscapes. And we also managed to access lots of seismic data that had been collected from underneath volcanoes. And some of these are incredibly evocative sounds. When you turn the seismic data into audio, you end up with these very crunchy sounds, which you kind of imagine are rocks and things scraping together. And we've actually used these sounds in our new work to generate mineral crystal formations. Our work is quite often all-consuming. I mean, working with animation is a very time-consuming process. And when we're making a project, it normally kind of takes over our lives. So we tend to invest ourselves a lot in the work. And I don't think that'll ever change. <laughs> it's not relevant for any That's kind of our philosophy. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> work ourselves stupid. <laughs>